In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the progressive wins and losses. We often associate the progressives with Teddy Roosevelt as president. And Teddy Roosevelt becomes the president in 1901. Uh, when McKinley's assassinated, he's elected in his own right in 1904. And at that point, he has done his two terms, and he says that he's going to step down. And what he does is he picks William Howard Taft, who was his secretary of war, to succeed him. Roosevelt and Taft were good friends, and Taft was an excellent man to get things done. However, he doesn't enjoy the spotlight, which makes him really very different from Teddy Roosevelt. He agrees with Roosevelt on many issues, um, and Taft, because he is so quiet, he seems in many ways to always be in Roosevelt's shadow. But Roosevelt tells the American people, vote for William Howard Taft, and in 1908, that is exactly what the American people do. And off goes Teddy Roosevelt, and now we've got William Howard Taft as president. And because he doesn't enjoy the spotlight, he is going to experience several problems. One of the problems is that while he is a very big trust buster, he actually breaks up more trusts than Teddy Roosevelt does. However, he doesn't believe in using the bully pulpit because he's so shy. Remember that Roosevelt was very comfortable in front of the crowd, and so he used the bully pulpit to really push what he believed in. He pushed the progressive agenda. People believed in it because he was telling them over and over and over again, this is important. This is what we're going to do. Taft doesn't do that. So in some ways, he has that problem of not really being able to sell his agenda. Another problem is going to be the Payne Aldrich Tariff. Generally speaking, progressives would like tariffs to be lower because if tariffs are lower, then it is going to make goods more affordable for the common man in America. And what Taft does is he signs the Payne Aldrich Tariff into law. And this is a tricky one. While it does lower a few tariffs, it actually raises several. And so it seems that even though he is a progressive, he's not doing what the progressives want with the Payne Aldrich tariff because you do see tariffs in some instances lower, but most of them do end up rising. So it seems in many ways that big business is still running things. Taft makes it worse by going out and telling the American people that this is one of the greatest tariff bills that has ever passed through uh, the White House, and people just can't believe it. Another area in which the progressives are dedicated is with conservation. And Roosevelt certainly believed in conservation. He worked uh, tirelessly with Gifford Pinchot here as a way to make sure that the American people and businesses and workers all had a square deal, that nature was available, not just for the American people, but that we were using it responsibly for the businesses. And one of the things that happens is that um, this man right here, Richard Bollinger, is brought in by Taft, and what he does is he removes about a million acres of land that had been reserved. So land that the U.S. government said, we are not selling this to any businesses or to any people. This is land that we are just reserving because it should be reserved. About a million acres of that land, Bollinger decides we are going to take and put it on the public list, as in it's available to the public. And Gifford Pinchot can't believe that this has happened. And when he criticizes that action by Bollinger, Taft actually fires Gifford Pinchot. And so it really is kind of confusing for a lot of progressives because Taft is a progressive. However, he's not promoting or really pushing their agenda in public. The tariffs are not going well. Conservation isn't going well, which takes us to Taft having to run for re-election in 1912. Roosevelt is furious, and he decides he wants to be president again. The Republicans decide in 1912 that they're going to skip or they're going to stick with William Howard Taft. The problem is that the Republicans are falling apart by 1910. There are some Republicans who are really very progressive, like Roosevelt, and they want to keep moving forward. However, there's also a part of the Republican Party that thinks all of these changes are happening too quickly, and they want changes to happen, but not as quickly as the progressives do. 
and Taft can't keep them united, and so the Republicans end up splitting. The Republicans, as an official party, are going to nominate Taft for a second term. The Democrats are going to nominate Woodrow Wilson, and Woodrow Wilson, as the Democrat, the advantage that he has is the Democrats are united behind him. Remember that the Republicans have kind of split here, and some of them will support Taft. However, there is a third party that enters the election of 1912, and that is going to be the political party that Teddy Roosevelt starts or becomes the head of, and that is the Progressive Party. The Progressive Party is nicknamed the Bull Moose Party. A bull moose is a male moose. And when Roosevelt talked about getting back involved for this, uh, for another term as president, people questioned, like, are you able to do this? Are you strong enough to do another term as president? And Roosevelt's reaction was, of course I am. I'm as strong as a bull moose. I can do this. You see him right here, sort of you've got the Washington uh, chastising Roosevelt that he is uh, violating that idea, that precedent of only serving two terms. But it doesn't really matter because in the actual election, the United Democrats are going to win. Remember the Republican split. Some of them will vote for Taft. Some of them are going to vote for Roosevelt. And that is why the Republicans lose. All three candidates supported change. Every one of them wanted to continue with progress. They just disagreed about what sort of change needed to happen and how quickly it was going to happen. So in 1912, Woodrow Wilson is going to take over as president. And he claims a lot of very progressive ideals. And the biggest area that he wants to attack is he wants to go after unfair business practices. He really wants to reform or improve businesses in the United States. If you look at what he wants to do with businesses, he specifically wants to go after tariffs. He thinks they're getting too high. He wants to go after trusts, break them up to give people a chance to compete. And he really wants to go after the banking industry. And Woodrow Wilson is someone who will use the bully pulpit like Roosevelt did. So let's see how he does. Under Woodrow Wilson, Congress is going to pass the Clayton Antitrust Act in 1914. And what this does is it goes and it looks at the Sherman Antitrust Act from before. And remember the big problem with this law was that they never really clearly defined what a trust was. In the Clayton Antitrust Act, they take care of a lot of those problems. Um, they protect labor unions as well as farm organizations from being labeled as trusts. They do a lot to really help protect uh, the workers with this. Also in 1914, the Federal Trade Act is passed. And what this does is it sets up a group of people who work for the government who are going to supervise big business, make sure that the businesses are doing what they are supposed to. So things that are happening, um, the Federal Trade Commission has the power to investigate violations of laws by businesses. They can demand reports from different corporations. And under Wilson, there are about 400 court orders uh, handed out to businesses regarding b illegal business activity. And the businesses are, businesses are told, you need to either stop this now or we will shut down your business. So we're really getting a much more involved government. Also, the Underwood tariff is um, passed, and this is actually going to lower tariffs. And now that the government is losing that source of revenue, it will lead to them taxing people's income with the 16th Amendment. The Federal Reserve Act is passed, and this is supposed to stabilize the economy. And what we're doing is we're starting to take a look at what can we have? What sort of bank can we have to help stabilize the economy? Remember that we used to have the National Bank, but we haven't had that in a while. And so what we do now is we bring back that idea of a national bank. However, instead of having just one national bank, we are going to have 12 banks established throughout the United States, and those will be the ones that our bankers banks. They are going to help the other banks and help make sure that things are stable. So if we think about how this whole thing got started, remember that it was Hamilton who first proposed having a national bank. 
and it was around for 20 years, but then the Democratic Republicans let it fade away. They let it die. And then another one was brought back. However, under Andrew Jackson, he decides he's not going to sign the bank bill to keep the bank open past its 20 years. So now we're starting to get that national bank back again. And here, if you look, you can see the different regions in the United States, the 12 regions, and where exactly this national bank is in each one. You can see that for us, Philadelphia right here is where you would find our closest um, Federal Reserve Bank. And what it does is these are the people who issue money. And if you look at a dollar bill, you will see Federal Reserve note written on there. And they control how much money is actually printed, how much money is out in circulation. If one bank is starting to falter, they will shift money around so that the banks are stable because that helps stabilize the economy. So in many ways, Wilson is doing a great job going after the businesses, specifically banking, but he's trying to really clean up businesses. However, there are failures. One of the things to note about Woodrow Wilson is that he does have a Southern background. And while he very much talks about having economic reform in the United States, and we're going to clean up businesses and give people a chance, as far as social reform, he doesn't really believe in that. He kind of gets pressured into supporting women's suffrage. People talk about doing something regarding all of the lynchings that are happening for uh, black people in the United States. And they say, we ought to make that a federal crime. The U.S. government should have an anti-lynching law. And Woodrow Wilson says, no, we're, we won't have a federal anti-lynching law. Each state can make that illegal, pass their own law, if they really want to. Um, he personally believes that segregation is a fair and just policy, and there's nothing wrong with Jim Crow laws. We should segregate people. And this ends up being his big failure as, um, as a progressive. As far as social reform, changing or improving society, that's not something he's really focused on. While he does use the bully pulpit, the progressive agenda is going to kind of fade into the background. And let's take a look at why. While Wilson is being criticized for his failure in civil rights, you know, allowing a segregation within the White House cabinets, the Capitol building goes back to being segregated. One of the biggest problems for the progressives ends up being the outbreak of World War I, because as World War I begins and is going on and on and on, Americans are paying attention to that. And that ends up being the more important thing for a lot of Americans rather than fixing problems in the U.S. Much like during the Civil War, people backed off of all of their reforms because they were focused on the war. The same thing happens here. And this is when you really see the progressives kind of fade into the background as people begin to look elsewhere for what seems to matter most. And with that, the progressives are quietly exiting.